Good morning and welcome to Hope. My name is Ashley Lentz. I'm one of your pastors here. I'm so glad you joined us this morning. I wanted to begin this message with the song that you just heard Kyle and Lindsay sing for us. It's called His Name is Jesus and it speaks to the identity of Jesus Christ. Who is he? You heard words like Savior, Messiah, Son of God. There's freedom in his name. These are things that describe our Savior and We're in this sermon series called Let Me Tell You a Story, where as preachers, we get to pick what we talk about, which is a really exciting thing and also kind of a really hard thing as a preacher, because I think everything in here is important and that we should talk about. So to pick something to talk about was really hard. And as I was flipping through um, stories that I really like, gospels that I really like, there was one that jumped out at me. It was Mark chapter 5, so if you have your Bibles, you can open there. That's That's where we'll start this morning is in the gospel of Mark. It's the power of Jesus that Mark portrays that really spoke to me as I thought, what do we need to talk about today? What does our society need? What do believers need to feel uplifted, to feel hopeful, and to feel some joy? And Mark works to answer this question that you heard repeated in the song, who is this king? Who is this king? You heard it over and over and over again. And as a Christian, you should probably be prepared to answer that question. Who is Jesus. You should have an elevator speech prepared just in case someone ever asks you, I know you go to church. Could you tell me about Jesus? So really quickly, take like 30 seconds, turn to a person next to you, give them one or two describing words. If somebody asked you, who is Jesus? What would you say? Go ahead. Give you a couple seconds. (laughs) 
I try to listen really intently, like, like, like what, can I, what can I pick up on from all of you? What I heard was really good theology, good work, everyone. He's a healer, he's savior, he's Messiah, he's the son of God, right? Who is this king? He, he's Jesus. And I want to dive into Mark's gospel this morning. I want to show you the power of who Jesus is as portrayed by our gospel writer, Mark. And so if you have your Bibles, open with me. We're going to start actually in Mark chapter 1. We'll come back to Mark 5. But Mark chapter 1, um, Mark tells us right from the start who Jesus is. He says, this is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Mark, it's the only time in his whole gospel that Mark will tell us who Jesus is. Otherwise, he wants you to figure this out for yourself as the reader. So some quick background on the gospel of Mark. Now, I love talking about culture. I love talking about this thing that we hold in our hands called the Bible. I love helping you understand what's in here. And so if you ever hold this and you think it's a little bit daunting, there's a, there's a lot, it's a little bit confusing— please set up a meeting with me. It would like fill my bucket to sit with you and walk you through any questions that you have. I think any of our pastors here at Hope would love that. We really love the Bible. And so just for a couple minutes, I'm going to talk about the gospel of Mark um, and how he talks about the power of Jesus, how he shows us the power of Jesus. On the screen, you'll see a picture. This is St. Mark's Basilica in Venice, Italy. Tyler and I had the opportunity to visit there in the fall of 2019. It's a holy space. You can't take pictures inside, and they actually believe uh, that the relics, the bones of Mark, the gospel writer, sit in in this basilica. Uh, But Mark is probably the first gospel written. And you say, well, actually, the New Testament starts with Matthew, and you are correct. It does start with Matthew, because for a lot of years, people thought that Matthew was the first gospel written. They were wrong. It's probably Mark. And so our New Testament canon, the New Testament order of books, starts with Matthew. Uh, But Mark was probably first. He wrote it probably like mid-late 60s, early 70s AD. Now Jesus died in like 30, 33. So we're talking 30-ish years after Jesus died. And what was happening at the time that Mark wrote his gospel is really important to know. Because Mark wrote his gospel to Christians in Rome who were being persecuted. And what was happening in Rome in the year 64 AD, Emperor Nero was reigning, and people really didn't like Nero that much. And in the year 64, most of Rome burned. 70% of Rome was burned to the ground because a fire started in, in a city slum, which was really common for the day. But because people hated Nero, and Nero was kind of mean, they blamed this fire on Emperor Nero. And so his public opinion dropped very quickly because of this giant fire. So he needed a scapegoat. Nero needed to blame this massive fire on somebody else. And a really easy target was this new group of people called the Christians. And so Christians were being heavily persecuted. They were being martyred for their faith, for something they did not do. But this is the world into which Mark writes his story. He writes the story about Jesus, and Mark writes as an eyewitness, somebody who witnessed Jesus' ministry And the way that he writes his gospel answers this question for us, who is Jesus? And Mark wants you to participate in the story. It's beautiful how he's written it. And so this morning, I want us to experience the power of Jesus Christ. I want you to know that your story is part of his story, that that power is for you, it is in you, and you have the ability to put that into the world around us. So really quickly, we start off in Mark. I told you this, Mark 1, verse 1. It's the only time Mark tells us who Jesus is. Otherwise, he wants you to figure out who Jesus is for yourself. Mark 1, verse 1. This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And then he immediately starts telling us, he shows us how Jesus lives up to being the Son of God, how this power flows through Jesus. Mark chapter 1, Jesus casts out evil spirits. He heals many. He preaches. He heals a leper. Mark chapter 2, he heals a paralyzed man. He redefines Sabbath. In Mark chapter 3, he heals on the Sabbath. Crowds follow him, cast out more evil spirits. These are things that only God can do. And the witnesses to Jesus' ministry knew this. What Jesus was doing was directly pointing at the fact that Jesus is Messiah. It was answering the question, who is Jesus? And we get to Mark chapter 4, and Jesus starts teaching. Not only is he showing us who Jesus is. He's teaching us about 
the kingdom of God. He's using everyday language to help people understand the kingdom of God on earth. He's helping them understand that he is bringing the kingdom of God to earth. And at the end of Mark chapter 4, Jesus calms a storm. At the end of that story, the disciples say, who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him. There's that question again. Who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him. It's the power of Jesus breaking into their lives. And it's shocking. They simply can't believe it. And honestly, they don't quite get it yet. Contrary to all the things that Mark has tried to show us. They don't quite get it. And this question that Mark writes, who is this man? It's rhetorical. He's inviting you and me, the reader, the original hearers, to answer it for ourselves. Do you believe that he's the Messiah yet? Are you catching on to what he's doing? Who is this man? Often I wish we could see Jesus' power in action. <clears throat> and don't get me wrong. We see Jesus' power in our world today. Often we see miracles. We see healing. We see cool things. And it's not just coincidence, it's Jesus. But what would it have looked like to watch Jesus calm this storm? What would it have felt like to watch him heal someone? I'm a very visual learner, so it's amazing to read about it. We can play a mind movie, right? We can kind of watch it in our minds maybe as we read. But there's this, uh, there's this net, not Netflix, YouTube series called The Chosen. I don't know if any of you have heard of this. In full disclosure, I have not watched a single episode, okay? I have a six-month-old. Do you know how long it takes us to watch one movie? A, <laughs> takes us about a week, okay? We just finished a movie, and it, no lie, took us a week because when you have a six-month-old, as you know, parents, you watch little chunks here and there when you have a chance. So I have not had time to watch this YouTube series called The Chosen, but it documents Jesus' life in a very realistic kind of way. And everything I've heard about it from other pastors at Hope, from a lot of you, is that it's really, really good. So I will watch it when I get a chance. But I want to show you. I want to show you Jesus' power as portrayed uh, by this show. And it's Jesus healing a leper. And just watch. I want you to watch the power of Jesus. Look at the faith of the leper. And contrast that with his disciples in this scene. Take a look. Not to spoil this beautiful day or anything, huh? <laughs> Come on. It's a leper. Stay back. Cover your mouth. Don't breathe his air. Don't come any closer. It's okay, John. Rabbi, 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 you Rabbi, cannot, Rabbi, it's disease, you Please. Please. Please don't turn away from me. I won't. Lord. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Only if you want to, I submit to you. My sister, she was a servant at the wedding. She told me what you could do. I know you can heal me if you are willing. I knew it. <laughs> Who is this man? He comes in power. He comes in authority. He comes with healing. 
And this brings us to Mark chapter 5, where I really want to focus our time today. I'm going to pick up Mark chapter 5 in verse 21. It's the account of Jesus raising Jairus' daughter, but in the middle of this story, somebody else is healed. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She'd suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she'd spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. This isn't the story of Jesus The point isn't Jesus healing this woman. The point is Jesus raising Jairus' daughter. So what is this major healing story doing in the middle of this other story? It's a literary technique called sandwiching. Mark does it on purpose. And whether this actually happened as Jesus was on his way to Jairus' house, we will never know. The point is Mark wants us to realize something really big. He uses this technique called sandwiching a few times so that we pick up on a very important something in the story. That important something in this story, it's about faith. It's about faith because Jesus realizes that healing power leaves him, that his power has healed this woman. But what he says to her is, daughter, your faith has made you well. So what has healed her? Is it Jesus' power? Or is it her faith? Healing power leaves him, but he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. The theologian N.T. Wright has something to say about this. He answers that question this way. He says, clearly it was Jesus' power. But Jesus says, your faith has rescued you. The answer must be that faith, though itself powerless, is the channel through which Jesus' power can work. And faith, however much fear and trembling may accompany it, is the first sign of that remaking, that renewal, that new life. Clearly it was Jesus' power, but faith is the channel through which Jesus' power can work. If faith is the channel through which Jesus' power is going to work in the world and in our lives, it begs the question, how's your faith today? How is your faith today? Is it this giant channel that's ready for God's power to flow in and through it? Is it abundant and overflowing in you? Or is your faith a little bit scarce these days? When I think about abundant faith, I think about uh, the dam at Sailorville. I grew up really close to this. You can walk to the spillway from my house. When that is open, there is a booming noise It is powerful, and you can see the force of water. That is abundant faith. It is this channel that is ready for Jesus' power to boom and flow through it. When I think about scarce faith, I think about a constricted vein or artery that might be blocked, that might lead to death. That's perhaps what a scarce faith looks and feels like. So how is your faith today? Do you believe in Jesus' power to work through it? Do you believe that he's going to change your life with that power, that he can change the world with this power? Do you believe that if you just reached out and barely touched him, you would be healed? That kind of power is for you. And we pick up the story in Mark 5, verse 35. 
While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. There it is again. Mark's point, it's about faith. Don't be afraid, Jairus, just have faith. Jesus gets to the home of Jairus' daughter, and, and people are mourning. The mourning celebration has already started. So there's commotion and weeping, and Jesus says, the child isn't dead, she's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave, and he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. And the girl who is 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus reaches down to a girl who is dead. He takes her hand, and in his native language, in Aramaic, he says to her, Talitha kum, little girl, get up. Child of God, arise. I chose Mark's account of this story because I love, number one, how Mark portrays Jesus' power throughout his whole gospel. But number two, Mark is the only gospel writer who has the Aramaic words of Jesus. Mark writes as an eyewitness to this. He wants you to feel like you're there. He wants you to feel like Jesus has reached down and touched you and looked at you and said, child, arise. He has commanded you, get up. Live in abundance. Do you believe in my power to heal you? Do you believe in my power for you to live joyfully? Do you believe in this? How's your faith? Is Jesus looking at you this morning and saying, arise, get up, live in what I have in store for you? Often I feel like we want this healing. We know it exists, but there's just something that separates us from that. And we think it's God. We think we're maybe not doing something right to earn that healing, to deserve it. I just, I'm not right with God yet, and therefore, fill in the blank. Jesus doesn't stand between us and healing. If you barely touch him, he will heal you. Does your faith believe that? And if your soul feels a little bit dead, he reaches out to you this morning and he says, arise, live in abundance, live in what I have for you. But perhaps what is separating us from that healing or from that power is healing. Perhaps we need some soul healing. Certainly there is physical healing that many of us need or we need in, in the lives of people that we love. And we absolutely pray for that. But I would say 90 to 95% of the time that I talk with lots of you, you're seeking soul healing. Our souls are tired. We're weary. The world is a little bit too overwhelming. We're busy. I'm wondering if that's the healing that you need this morning. Your soul needs to be touched by Jesus. You need to hear this command for yourself, arise, live in abundance. So what is preventing that healing from taking place? What is preventing your faith from being this massive, abundant channel that God's power is going to flow through? Last weekend, Pastor Scott preached on the gift of limits, how important God's boundaries are for our life. And when we live within those boundaries, that actually brings healing. That actually brings wholeness. And so perhaps overstepping God's boundaries might be preventing us from experiencing this healing, this fullness. Go back and listen on the podcast or watch on YouTube if you missed that. <clears throat> the thing that's been laid on my heart in the last couple weeks, as I was preparing this message, what's preventing this healing from taking place? I think it's our culture. I think it's our mindset. It's a thing called a scarcity mindset. We also live in a scarcity culture. I see it all around me all the time. A scarcity mindset says there is a finite amount of love. There is a finite amount of empathy. There is a finite amount of grace or healing. And if I give that away, if I put that into the world, or if I take that from someone, that is one piece of the pie that's gone. I will never get it back. And that's not biblical. That's not what Jesus says. He says these things are for you. They are in abundance. There is infinitely more than we could ever ask or imagine. But we live in a culture that tells us otherwise. And along with a scarcity 
mindset comes comparative suffering. It's something I learned from the PhD researcher Brené Brown. And in March of 2020, she released a podcast. She has a podcast. It's called Unlocking Us. And in March of 2020, she talks about on that podcast scarcity mindset and comparative suffering. Do you remember what happened in March of 2020? That was the beginning of COVID. <laughs> That's when it really started to deeply affect all of our lives. And here's what she has to say about a scarcity mindset and comparative suffering. She says, you can tell a culture is deeply in scarcity when a conversation at a cultural level revolves around, what should I be afraid of right now? And whose fault is it? Let me say that again. You can tell a culture is deeply in scarcity when the conversation at a cultural level revolves around, what should I be afraid of right now? And whose fault is it? Does this sound like the world that we live in? I'm not sure what you should be afraid of right now, but the world tells me I should be afraid of war, I should be afraid of disease or viruses, I should be afraid of politics, no matter where you fall on that, on that scale. There's a ton of things to be afraid of. And who can I point the finger at? Whose fault is it that I'm afraid of those things? This is a scarcity mindset, and it's the norm. It's what we wake up to every day. It's what we are bombarded with every day. Comparative suffering plays into this. And I want to talk about comparative suffering just briefly because I hear it all the time. I'm guilty of it. Comparative suffering sounds like this. I'm talking with a friend and they say, how are you doing? And I say, oh, I'm really tired. Paxton woke up three times last night, right? He usually wakes up four, by the way. Anyway. Comparative suffering sounds like this, okay? So I say that, and the mom that I'm talking to says, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. My child is teething or has an ear infection or is super sick and didn't sleep last night. And I say, oh, yours is way worse than mine. I'm really sorry, you know? Okay, we do it all the time. This is called comparative suffering. I just compared what's hard in my life to what's hard in somebody else's life. And in doing so, I just degraded what I'm going through. And here's why this is a problem. Because Jesus tells us that he walks with us all the time. He's with us in everything. And so if that thing is hard for me, Jesus is with me in it. He promises to be in it. And when I compare my suffering to the suffering of somebody else, I say, it doesn't really matter what I'm going through. Jesus doesn't really have the time or the power to help me. He should probably help you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to degrade what he's doing in my suffering because your suffering is bigger than mine. Again, it's not biblical. Stop comparing your suffering to other people's. It puts us into a scarcity mindset. God wants you to know he is with you in everything that you go through every day, big and little and everything in between. Stop comparing. It only hurts us. The power of Jesus is to tell us how much more, is to show us how much more he has in store for us. We might live in a scarcity culture. I don't think we're going to change it. It's the way that our world is. But you can absolutely change your life. You can absolutely change your family and the people that you are around every day with what's called an abundant mindset. There's a difference between a scarcity mindset and, a, and an abundant mindset. And scripture is very clear that there is abundance for you. It comes in Jesus' power. How much more, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7. He's preaching. It's the Sermon on the Mount. He says, parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Of course not. So you sinful people, we're all sinful people. If we know how to good, give good gifts to our children, how much more? more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask of him? How much more is there for you in this life than the day-to-day -day grind? I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm not dismissing your suffering. We're all going through stuff. It's really hard. But in the midst of that, your mindset can be scarce or your mindset can be abundant. And one of them is how Jesus plans for you to live. A scarcity mindset starts with fear. Do you remember the question that Brene Brown poses? What can I be afraid of right now? Scarcity starts with fear. It leads to anxiety or worry, poor choices, and negative outcomes. Fear, anxiety, poor choices, negative outcomes. It's exhausting. That sounds horrible. What Jesus has in store for us is abundance. The abundance loop starts with gratitude. 
It starts with thankfulness. It leads to peace of mind, leads to wise choices and positive outcomes. Gratitude, peace of mind, wise choices, and positive outcomes. I don't know about you, but personally, we preach on things that we ourselves are working on. In the last couple weeks, I've noticed just in myself that my rhetoric, the way that I talk to people, I sound tired, okay? There's good reason for that. Paxton really doesn't sleep that well, okay? That's legit. But it's nothing that nobody else hasn't experienced either, and I'm not going to compare my suffering to what you're going through. But the reality is that I, can, that I get to choose my mindset in this struggle. I can put out into the world my fear of not enough sleep, my fear of not enough time to get stuff done because my child doesn't sleep, my worry if he will ever sleep again. Do you, he, do you hear how this works? I know it's a silly example, but I am dead serious. This is my reality. And for the last couple weeks, I've been in a scarcity mindset. And it's exhausting. I'm tired of it. I don't want to put that into the world. Do you know what an abundant mindset sounds like? Man, I am so grateful. I have a child who wants to hang out with me all night. (laughs) Yeah. Man, I am so grateful that he wants to eat, that he can eat, that I have a child who's healthy, right? It sounds different. Same reality. It sounds a lot different. And would our world be such a different place if we trusted in God's abundance? If we started with gratitude every day in the face of everything that we're going through? I want you to hear a little bit more about this abundant mindset. Um, and I want you to hear it from Brené Brown herself. I just introduced you to who she is. She, I'm going to show you, a, it's about a five-minute clip, so it's a little bit longer than usual. Stick with me. Five-minute clip, she's talking to Oprah on a segment called Super Soul Sunday, And she speaks as a researcher, so Oprah's going to even ask her to slow down at one point. So stick with me through the clip. It gets a little bit wordy, gets a little deep. But she's going to talk about an abundant mindset compared to scarcity. And she's going to talk about the power of gratitude and the power of joy and how joy can actually propel us into scarcity or it can propel us into abundance. And take a look at how they talk about this. It's very powerful. I will never talk about joy for the rest of my career without talking about gratitude. Because for 12 years of research, I have never interviewed a single person who talks about the capacity to really experience and soften into joy who does not actively practice gratitude. You are absolutely right about that. Period. See, I have done no research except with my audience for 25 yeah, years. Yeah, except for that, the 30 years of yeah, the research except you've for done. That. Yeah, except for yeah, that little, but I've done yeah. no, obviously, a f- cr- critical research, but I know that is true. As you say that, it just, a part of me, it just resonates, and I know that is true. There is no joy without gratitude. No, and he, you know what's tricky? What? As someone who studies shame and scarcity and fear, mm-hmm. I will tell you that if you ask me what's the most terrifying, difficult emotion that we experience as humans, yes. Yes. I would say joy. You would say that the most terrifying is joy? No question. Why? You know, I, I often ask parents, I say, uh, you know, I'll have 5,000 parents or something in the audience, and I'll say, raise your hand if you've ever stood over your child while he or she was sleeping and thought to yourself, I love you like I didn't know was possible. Yeah, yeah. And then in that split second, picture something horrific happening well, to your child. What if something happened to you? Yes, yeah. How many of you have ever sat up and said, wow, work's going good? Good relationship with my partner. Yeah. Parents seem to be doing okay. Uh huh. Something bad's going to happen. happen. Yes. Right. So, what is that? You know what that is? What is that? When we lose our tolerance for vulnerability, lose our tolerance for vulnerability, yeah. Joy becomes foreboding. I'm not going to feel you. I'm not going to, I'm not going to soften into this moment of joy because, because I'm scared. I'm scared it's going to be taken away. The other shoe's going to drop. So say that again. When we lose our tolerance for vulnerability, you said in the book, but I didn't get it this deep. Go ahead. When we lose our tolerance yeah. to be vulnerable, yes. joy becomes foreboding. And so what we do in moments of joyfulness is we try to beat vulnerability to the punch. Yesterday, I'm on the plane. I'm yeah. getting ready to leave. I'm taking pictures and tweeting them out of Almond Cockpit, Super Soul Sunday, or Oprah <laughs> or Bus, maybe. I'm taking pictures. The plane gets down the runway and has to come back because something's wrong. I was like, I knew it. 
I called Steve. I said, let me just tell you something. I know because I'm fixing to meet Oprah <laughs> that I'm going to die. <laughs> and at my funeral, yeah. you better say she was going to be on Super Soul Sunday. Oh, my goodness. And she's like, for boating joy, for boating for joy. For boating joy. Right. I interviewed a man who told me my whole life, I never got too excited, too joyful about anything. I just kind of stayed right in the middle. That way, if things didn't work out, I wasn't devastated. And if they did work out, it was a pleasant surprise. Oh, my goodness. He's, and so many people said, he said, in his 60s, he was in a car accident. His wife of 40 years was killed. Uh-huh. Wow. And he said, the second I realized that she was gone, the first thing I thought was, I should have leaned harder into those moments of joy. Because mm. that did not protect me from what I feel right now. We're trying, to, we're trying to dress rehearse tragedy so we yes. can beat vulnerability to the punch. Yes, 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 yes. So you, want, so you know what happens? This is what the joyful people do. This is what I learned from them. In those moments where like, they're getting ready to come here or so they're looking at their children or their partner or something great, they get that shudder too, but you know what they do? They don't say, ooh, there's that shudder of terror about feeling joyful, I'm gonna dress rehearse tragedy. They say, I'm gonna practice gratitude. So I just sat on that plane on the runway for 20 minutes going, I'm grateful, I'm grateful. But gratitude is a practice. It is tangible, you can see it. Yeah. It's not an attitude of gratitude. Absolutely, it is a practice. And what I found is that when you actively practice gratitude, where you concentrate on not just thinking about it, but write things down, you go through the day looking for it. You There's go no through question. The, you go through the day looking for it. Isn't it amazing? It's mm -hmm. like magic. It is. And you know what I think we appreciate? The little things. Yes. I think one of the things that happens in a culture of scarcity is we're all chasing the extraordinary and we forget. Like when I interviewed people who went through horrific things, I mean, I'm talking about the loss of children, genocide, violence, trauma. And I talked to them about what's the hardest loss. They never talked about the extraordinary things. They said, I miss the ordinary moments. I miss hearing the screen door slam and knowing my husband's home from work. Mm -hmm. I miss hearing my kids fighting in the backyard. I miss the way that my wife set the table. And those are the moments that are in front of all of us every day. How's your joy today? That's how I began our weekly newsletter. If you don't get that, you should get that. How's your joy today? Honestly, in the world around me, I don't see enough of it. We live in scarcity. We believe that healing, God's power, time and love, there's only a finite amount. It's too exhausting to put it out there. I'm gonna reserve it. It grows exponentially. It is abundantly yours because of God's power, because of Jesus' power in and through you. How's your joy? How's your faith? Is your faith an abundant channel for that power to flow through? Jesus wants to look at you today. Reach out his hand and touch your soul and say, Talitha kum, arise. Child of mine, get up. Abundance is yours. I came so that you could live abundantly right now. No, the world's not perfect, but I came so that you could experience joy. Abundance leads to gratitude, leads to joy. <clears throat> when I meet with people in my office, Oftentimes, those, those, com those conversations begin with all the hard stuff. And sometimes it comes off as a list, and that's okay. That's what I'm here for. I'm here to, to absorb that and take it to the cross for you. But the minute we finish the list of everything that's going poorly, I look at people and I say, tell me one thing that's going good. Tell me one thing you're thankful for. I've never had somebody who couldn't come up with one thing. But in that split second, certainly we talk about the hard stuff. But in that split second, your mindset has just shifted from scarcity to abundance the second you can name something good. That is God's plan for you every single day. There's a book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. I'm teaching a class on that in the fall. Um, registration will open in August. You can look for it. There's a chapter on healing. And the way that Peter Scazzaro ends that chapter on healing, he says, true spirituality, healed spirituality, frees us to live joyfully in the present. That's how that clip with Oprah and Brené Brown ended. Living joyfully in the present. 
when I thought practical application. That's how sermons should end, right? It's like, I can't preach all this stuff to you and then send you away with not telling you how to do it. I thought, I don't know how to tell you to shift from, from scarcity to abundance other than telling you you should do it. And then I saw that clip and I thought, that's how you do it. It's gratitude. It's appreciating the teeny tiny things. You don't need the booming voice of God to tell you to experience him in abundance. He's there abundantly all the time. Are you looking for it? How's your soul feeling? Is his command to that little girl, that dead little girl, is it his command to your soul this morning? Arise. Live in this. My power is for you. It is all over scripture. Paul writes about it in Ephesians 3. All glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work where? In us. His mighty power at work within us to accomplish what? Infinitely more than we might ask or think. Other translations say abundantly more than we might ask or think. Jesus is speaking in John 16 and he says, ask using my name and you will receive and you will have abundant joy. Abundant joy. This power is yours, church. In Jesus' name, it is yours. Accept it, receive it this morning. Let's all arise. Let's stand together and sing about God's power.